Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the Neurosurgicals TV. Today we have a new like webinars like launch. It's the Neurosurgical Bootcamp. It's the webinar from residents to residents from the mentors in neurosurgeries. Today we have our guest uh, moderator, Professor Kate Drummonds. She is the neurosurgeon from Australia. She works at the Royal Melbourne Hospitals. Please welcome Dr. Kate. Welcome everybody. Thank you very much for uh, attending this first of the neurosurgical boot camps from the uh, National Neuroscience Institute in Singapore. Um, as Warlock said, this is going to be uh, by residents for residents. We've got three topics that uh, really are of interest to anyone aspiring to be a great neurosurgeon. Uh, so we've got three topics which will be presented over the course of about 15 or 20 minutes. And if you have questions, um, then uh, if you could put them into the chat uh, and we'll endeavour to answer them. And if you don't have questions, then I'll make some up that are probably even harder. So you better be kind to the speakers and, uh, and come up with some nice questions. So I'd just like to introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Tian Meng. And he's going to speak on principles of intracranial pressure management. Okay, uh, hi, uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Kate. Um, yeah, I'm Tian Ming from uh, um, uh, Singapore. I uh, would like to thank everyone for attending this talk. Um, I'll share my screen now. Okay, yeah, uh, can everyone see? Okay, great, yeah. So um, today I'm going to talk about the um, uh, principles of intracranial pressure management. Um, so what I'm going to go through today, uh, firstly, to understand the pathophysiology of raised intracranial pressure, to know the methods of monitoring intracranial pressure, uh, to describe the management of intracranial pressure in the setting of traumatic brain injury. So firstly, what is intracranial pressure? So intracranial pressure is defined as the pressure exerted by intracranial contents on the skull. The normal intracranial pressure is in the range of 5 to 10, uh, with more than uh, 20 millimeters mercury considered pathological. And uh, this is a very important uh, principle that we need to understand uh, when we're managing uh, patients with high uh, intracranial pressure. Uh, basically, the Monroe Kelly principle states that um, the, the skull is of a rigid space uh, containing brain, blood, and CSF. Uh, any increase in any of the compartments uh, uh, can be compensated without a raise in ICP. Uh, however, when the compensation fails, as, um, as we can see uh, over on, on, on the figure, uh, ICP can raise exponentially. So what causes a raised ICP? A uh, raised ICP can be caused by any increase in any of the intracranial contents, namely the brain, blood, CSF, and also any pathological uh, mass in the brain. An in, uh, increase in brain can be due to cerebral edema, which can be cytotoxic or vasogenic edema. Increase in blood can be due to defective autoregulation, such as hyperemia after a post-AVM uh, resection uh, and in traumatic brain injury, and also in uh, uh, cerebral venous thrombosis when the venous outflow is uh, obstructed. Um, it, increase in CSF can be caused by hydrocephalus, um, and also uh, any ex, any uh, any pathological mass such as tumor and blood clot can cause a raise in ICP. So why is it a problem? Uh, well, when the ICP initially increases, uh, it can actually decrease uh, perfusion pressure. Uh, and that uh, if uh, blood flow actually is lo low enough to, um, and, and it can't meet the metabolic demands of the brain, uh, ischemia can occur. Further increase in intracranial pressure, especially in one particular component of the brain, can actually force the brain out from one component into another component. And when that happens, uh, what we can uh, notice in a patient is herniation syndromes, which I will go through uh, a bit later. Yeah. So what are the clinical features of raised ICP? So patient commonly presents with headache, classically a headache that's worse in the morning, uh, nausea, vomiting, drowsiness, and somnolence. When we examine a patient, uh, we usually find that the G GCS can be slightly depressed. Um, there will be abnormal pupillary reaction, which I will go through later. Uh, there can be papilloedema, 
Uh, but however, this is more uh, common in the setting of chronic uh, raised ICP, in the setting of tumor and benign intracranial hypertension. In acute, in acute uh, raised ICP, this is not so common. It can also be six nerve palsy. Uh, as we all know, the abducent nerve has the longest intracranial course and uh, can be very susceptible to stretching uh, damage due to the raised ICP. Also, with raised ICP, there can be weakness or abnormal posturing, which I will describe later. So um, when we are managing uh, patients with raised ICP, it's important to understand and to interpret the ICP waveform. A normal ITCP waveform consists of uh, three waves, the P1, P2, and P3. The P1 is a percussion wave, uh, which corresponds to pulsation of intracranial arteries. P2 is a tidal wave, which is actually from the rebound from brain elastance. And P3 is a dichotic wave, which corresponds to that dichotic notch in arterial waveform. A rising P2 component uh, can signify that the brain is becoming less compliant. As we can see in the pressure volume curve, curve here, in the flat part of the curve, um, the waveform uh, will be as such when the P2 component is higher than P1. As the, as the brain starts to lose its compliance, P2 will actually go above uh, P1. And in this uh, setting, any small increase in intracranial um, uh, content volume can lead to large change in intracranial pressure. So we go through the herniation syndromes. This is what happens when uh, a high intracranial pressure in one compartment of the brain forces the brain into another compartment. Uh, firstly, you can look at this is the sub falcine herniation. is when the cingulate gyrus um, herniates under the fox cerebri and compresses the anterior cerebral arteries, ca causing uh, anterior cerebral artery territory infarct. An ankle herniation can cause um, compression of the oculomotor nerve leading to unilateral pupillary dilatation, and also compression, compression of an ipsilateral crust cerebri leading to contralateral weakness. With transtentorial and tonsillar herniation, there can be extensive damage to the brain stem, causing bilateral fixed and dilated pupils. And lastly, um, as a very late sign of raised ICP, is the Cushing's reflex, and the patient can uh, manifest with hypertension, bradycardia, respiratory irregularities, and they are usually a sign of um, brainstem injury. We also must uh, remember that um, raised ICP is a very important component of um, secondary brain, uh, trauma, brain damage in setting of trauma, and it should be managed appropriately. So how can we monitor um, ICP? Um, it can be monitored via invasive and non-invasive uh, uh, methods. So for invasive methods, uh, there is a ventriculostomy, um, intraparenchymal monitor, subdural, epidural, and also subarachnoid monitors. Non-invasively, there is a TCD ultra ultrasonography of derived uh, pulsatility index, uh, which is seen on the uh, picture on the left side. Um, and on the right side is ultrasound measurement of optic nerve diameter. But the methods of uh, monitoring that we commonly use in clinical setting, uh, the two most common are external ventricular drain and intraparenchymal monitor. The advantage of external ventricular drain um, is that it allows a therapeutic drainage of CSF. It can be also be re-zeroed anytime uh, at bedside. The disadvantage, however, is that it requires a free-flowing column of CSF to work. So if there is any uh, blockage of the EVD, uh, whether by blood or by debris, the ICP actually can't be uh, uh, read. Uh, uh, can't be read. There's also increased risk of uh, catheter-associated infection and ventriculitis, ventriculitis in a, in a, with prolonged EVD use. For intraparenchymal monitor, it has advantage in the sense that there is less risk of infection, it's easier to be inserted, and also certain um, intraparenchymal uh, catheters comes with multi-model monitoring capabilities. The disadvantage is that uh, we are unable to drain CSF for therapeutic purposes. And also, uh, they experience zero drift, uh, which with prolonged use of ICP, they can be less accurate. So when do we monitor patients? Um, well, the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines suggest that we, mon we monitor uh, patients um, to use uh, the information from ICP monitor to manage uh, severe patients with severe brain injury. However, in our institute, we monitor patients where we find that a reliable uh, neurological examinations um, cannot be performed and or who patients have uh, abnormal CT scans who are at risk of raised ICP. 
So what are the goals of ICP treatment? The goals of ICP treatment is to maintain uh, cerebral blood flow and also to prevent herniation syndromes. The target uh, that uh, we usually try to achieve is a cerebral perfusion pressure of 60 to 70 and intracranial pressure of less than 22. And this is from the uh, latest uh, Brain Trauma Foundation. Oh. Slide. So what can we do to uh, treat um, ICP? Well, ICP management can be performed in a stepwise protocol uh, manner. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the steps are arranged in increments of risk and intensity. So it's uh, always important to remember that whenever ICP is not sufficiently controlled, we have to review and optimize the current um, tiers of therapy and consider a CT brain uh, to exclude new or developing mass lesions uh, that may be surgic surgically evacuable. If there is no surgical mass lesion, then we can consider escalation to the next tier of therapy. So uh, for tier one, um, this can be implemented in all uh, patients with uh, a severe traumatic brain injury with a risk of raised ICP. The patient should be maintained with a saturation of more than 95%. Um, cerebral metabolic uh, requirements should be decreased with the implementation of sedation, analgesia, neuromuscular blockade, and aggressive treatment of hyperpyrexia. The patient should also be nursed with, neck, with a neck in a neutral position and head up in a position of 30 to 45 degrees. This uh, optimizes uh, venous drainage, uh, but also uh, maintains CPP. Patients' uh, glucose should be tightly controlled. Um, the PaCO2 should be maintained in a level of 35 to 40, uh, and seizure prof prophylaxis should be given. And any seizure should also be treated aggressively. This is an example of a patient with a severe traumatic brain injury. As we can all see, the patient is nursed uh, with a head up in about 45 degrees and neck in neutral positions, and also intubated uh, for, uh, to decrease uh, cerebral metabolic, um, uh, metabolic activity. So what happens when uh, the ICP still can't be controlled? Then we can move on to tier two therapy, which consists of hyperventilation, hyperosmolar therapy, CSF drainage, and mild hypothermia. Hyperventilation works by decreasing CO2 which causes vasoconstriction, which reduces ITP. The disadvantage of this is that uh, there is risk of ischemia, and uh, it only brings about a short-term benefit as the body quickly compensates with metabolic acidosis. It should only really be used for, uh, as a bridge for more definite treatment, or only with monitoring of brain tissue oxygenation. So um, the recommendation by the uh, Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines, uh, the main recommendation is that prolonged prophylactic hyperventilation with PaCO2 of less than 25 millimeters mercury is not recommended. Osmo therapy consists of uh, mentol and hypertonic saline. Uh, mentol works by improving deformity of red blood cell, leading to reactive vasoconstriction, thereby reduce, reducing ICP. Uh, these are the early effects of mentol. In the longer term, uh, mentol is an osmotic diuret diuresis and therefore causes a sustained um, um, control, uh, sustained effects in ICP control. Uh, side effects of mentol is hypotension and hypovolemia and renal failure if the serum or osmolality rises above 320. Hypertonic saline comes in a few forms, 3%, 7%, and 23%. Um, it works by being an osmotic agent that draws fluid from the brain. It can be given in either a bolus uh, manner or as a continuous infusion. There's, however, no evidence to suggest that one um, therapy is superior to, to the other in the management of ICP. Uh, for um, TSF drainage, uh, it can achieve a rapid reduction in ICP. And we must understand that when we're dealing with patients with raised ICP, we are working in a non-compliant part of the pressure mm -hmm. volume. Therefore, even a drainage of very small amounts of CSF can actually cause a large change in intracranial pressure. Hypothermia works by decre decreasing uh, CMRO2 and does so uh, by 6 to 7% for every uh, of the, uh, body temperature. And at about 18 to 20 degrees Celsius, bursts of pressure. The effect of hypothermia is not recommended. Could everybody mute? Yeah. Okay.
based on the latest um, Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines. So moving on to the th third tier of therapy, um, one of it is barbiturate coma. Uh, side effect is, is hypotension, hypokalemia, and increased in risk of infection. Yeah. It can be given in 250 milligrams bolus with an infusion of four to eight milligrams per kilogram per hour to achieve and to maintain birth suppression. The goals of a barbiturate coma is um, ICP control, or when uh, it, it should be, it should not, uh, it should stop when side effects occur as well, or when birth suppression EEG happens. Uh, as uh, when the EEG is in birth suppression, the brain is at a minimal metabolic state, and therefore any increase in um, the dose of barbiturate coma will not have any beneficial effects in ICP. Uh, there's two, um, uh, two articles that uh, show evidence for the use of barbiturate coma. Eisenberg in 1988 shows that um, barbiturate coma improved uh, the chance of ICP control by twofold. However, a Cochrane review in 2012 shows that although ICP can be controlled, but it does not reduce mortality, but in fact increases the risk of infection. Therefore, the, the recommendation by um, the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines is that um, high dose barbiturate coma is only recommended to control elevated ICP refractory to minimum standard level and surgical treatment. No dynamic stability is essential before and during barbiturate therapy. So lastly, uh, decompressive craniectomy in the setting of um, raised ICP. So it is a, um, a hotly debated uh, topic and two uh, articles um, tried to answer the question. And uh, basically, this one is an article published uh, in uh, 2011, the, the DECRA trial, and also the Rescue ICP trial in 2016. Yeah. Based on the results of uh, both of these um, um, uh, uh, trials, uh, the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines recommended that for late refractory ICP elevation, um, secondary decompressive craniectomy can be performed um, to improve mortality and favorable outcomes. However, for early refractory ICP elevations, it is not recommended. And if it is performed, a large frontal temporal parietal uh, decompressive craniectomy is recommended over a small uh, decompressive craniectomy. So in summary, um, increase in one component of intracranial content can be compensated by decrease in others. When the compensation fails, ICP rises. And ICP can be monitored to guide the management of raised ICP. The management of raised ICP should be performed in a stepwise protocol, and we should always uh, review and optimize uh, the, current, the current tier of management whenever ICP is uh, rising, and also to consider CT brain to exclude uh, surgical, surgically evacuable mass lesion. And if there is done, we should escalate to the next tier of therapy. So that's the end of my uh, presentation. Um, are there any questions? So if anyone's got any questions, if you'd like to um, write them in the chat. Um, thanks, Tiang Meng. That was a great presentation. Really good summary of the literature. Um, so you, you, I, I noticed that you've said that you didn't think there was any difference between uh, hypertonic saline mm -hmm. and, and mannitol, and yet it mm -hmm. seems as though all of the intensive care units have gone over to hypertonic saline. Could you expand at all on what might be the benefits or risks of either of them? Well, uh, with hypertonic saline, because um, it is uh, less of a osmotic diuresis, so it can actually, um, theoretically, it can uh, maintain intravascular volume and therefore maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure. That is one of the main um, advantages of hypertonic saline over uh, mannitol use uh, that I know of. I think the other question is that perhaps um, if used repeatedly, if mannitol leaches out of damaged vessels and sits in the brain, it can actually draw water to it and make cerebral edema worse over time. That seemed to be the prevailing wisdom. I don't know if, uh, if Dr. Rao, your mentor, has got anything to say about that or... Yeah, so I, I think it depends on the prolonged usage. So uh, it depends on how we give it. Uh, I must say in our ICUs in Singapore, it depends on our intensivists. Um, some of the UK trained ones uh, still go with mannitol, uh, but the, our intensivists that have been trained in Australia uh, are more comfortable with hypertonic saline. Uh, and, and personally, um, 
we we have given them leeway in the in the protocol. Uh, but there has been more of a shift towards hypertonic saline to uh, to remove the rebound uh, as well with intermittent boluses and to could it keep it as a continuous infusion. I think it depends on your age as well. Mm. When you're starting to age like me, hypertonic saline didn't exist. So I, I, I love a bit of mannitol, but I must, <laughs> I must admit that I, there are some advantages for intravascular volume with the hypertonic saline. So I was interested, I, I haven't seen any questions, but I was interested to see the change in recommendations on um, decompressive craniectomy. So, you know, what are you guys doing it, doing in Singapore? How many de decompressive craniectomies are you doing? And I don't mean leaving the bone flap out after evacuating a mass lesion. I mean a primary decompressive craniectomy. Mm, actually, we... If the ICP is not um, controlled despite uh, best uh, medical therapy, we do still uh, do a decompressive craniectomy. So when you've come to the end of all other options? Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. yeah. How often, what sort of percentage of head injuries would you be doing that in roughly, do you think? Is it a common or an uncommon event? It's actually quite uncommon. Uh, yeah. I, I would say we are doing less now uh, since DECRA came out. Uh, than before DECRA was. Uh, and I think the medical treatment is actually better done now as well, that the number of patients that we need to actually decompress is much lesser. Yeah, I think it's become almost, very, I mean, very rare now in Australia. Um, but I wonder whether, you know, yeah, these things come in and out of fashion. I start, I'm starting to wonder whether we're, we're missing perhaps the odd patient who, you know, as they say, in a delayed fashion when all other mechanisms have been exhausted, that perhaps it might, it might be something to do. I think you've got to think a little bit about the scan as well. You know, um, you can have raised ICP with a scan that looks moderately normal and uh, that might give you a little bit more hope of a good outcome than the raised IP, ICP of a scan that's really, you know, got widespread contusions or, or you know, bilateral, bilateral damage that might really lead to a bad outcome. Has anyone got any, any further comments on raised intracranial pressure or, or questions? I believe they have a question asking from our panelist to the speaker. Uh, from the Dr. Muhammad, he say he asked a question: Is there any indication systenotomy to reduce the ICP? And second question is: What is guideline for the best reduced ICP in severe head injury? Yeah. Um, so for the systenotomy, it is not practiced in um, in this in, in 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 my institute at least. And I don't think, I'm not sure if there's any evidence out there that supports the use of systenostomy, uh, to be honest. Um, what was the second question again? Uh, he asked, what is, I think maybe he asked like in the guideline, what is the best uh, methods to reduce the ICP in severe head injury? Yeah. I mean, I think um, it can be, uh, it's, it's common, uh, therapies to reduce ICP can be implemented in, the, in a tiered fashion. Um, I don't think there's a best or, or therapy uh, in, in, in that sense. Uh, but generally, um, what we tend to uh, follow is the recommendations from um, uh, Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines. So, so I, I'll just add that uh, actually the best procedure to, de to reduce ICP is a decompressive craniectomy. Right, because you are, if you remove the Monroe Kelly principle concept, then you understand that. But it does not mean that the reduction of ICP leads to a better outcome. So uh, I think we have to keep in touch with the literature of the new modalities of monitoring uh, that are coming out. So in Singapore, we've moved to an oxygen tiered um, decompression idea where even if ICP is normal and uh, oxygenation is compromised, uh, you may still need interventions uh, for it. 
So I think the data that is coming out is is shifting a little bit from just a pressure related problem. Uh, and obviously with the AI algorithms that come out uh, and imaging loading into that, uh, I think we're in an interesting field in terms of looking at decision-making algorithms. Um, and we probably need to pay more attention to that. There, I've just got one more question. Does anyone carry out cystocystinostomy in surgeries with hemicraniectomy? I mean, uh, I don't know that there's much evidence for any of those. Um, okay, so um, thank you, Tian Meng. I might Thanks. move along now. That was a fantastic presentation.